Hey there everyone, on this episode I'm really excited to share with you how I created this arctic erosion coffee table from white concrete and epoxy. This project feels a bit like a culmination of a lot of the processes and materials I've been learning about over the last three to four years as a maker. We've got spraying and pouring concrete, we've got pouring epoxy, we've got woodworking for the base, we've got digital fabrication to create the foam form, and even a bit of metalworking. So there's a lot going on, let's get right into it. I started out by cleaning off the melamine that I previously used to make my TV lift countertop so I can use it again. I often feel guilty about the amount of waste that I generate by doing concrete work, so reusing melamine is a small way I can reduce the eco footprint of my work. I'd be lying if I said I planned this table as some sort of artistic statement about climate change. Honestly, it was just designing something that I thought looked really cool and, well, I am going to be dumping about three gallons of plastic into that concrete layer. But since it looks a bit like a frozen landscape melting away, I'll let you read as much or as little symbolism into it as you like. And a quick PSA to always adjust your miter sled whenever you change the blade angle or cut side on your miter sled. Because this happened again. I know. It's the second time. So I've got all the melamine pieces for the form cut to size, and the melamine itself is really pretty simple. It's just a box. Over here, we've got what really makes this project unique, and that's these foam cutouts that are going to be placed inside of the form. Now, since we're pouring the table upside down, pouring the concrete over the foam will create a cavity or a recession in the concrete that we can then come back and fill with clear blue epoxy. Now you can cut these pieces of foam out with a bandsaw or a jigsaw if you like, but it's definitely a little easier if you use a CNC. I'll have files below that allow you to do it either way. For now, I'm going to show you how I cut mine out with my Inventables x card. I started by using Affinity Designer to create a 2D sketch of how I wanted the layers to look. I then imported the SVG file from Designer into Inventables free easel software. An easel, I separated out each layer so I could cut the layers individually. The foam cuts really well with the compression bit on the X-Carve. And it's fast. I did quarter inch deep passes at about 60 inches per minute. I used a 150 grit sanding pad to quickly sand off the tabs that were holding the piece in place when it was done. I then attached one side of the form to the base. You'll see why in a minute, but I'm going to attach the other three sides after I've glued the foam to the inside of the form. To secure the foam, I just used some general purpose spray adhesive. I glued the bottom piece to the form first, and then glued the layers on one by one to build up the 3D foam knockout shape. Since the foam knockout is bigger than the bed of the X-Carve, I decided to make it in two halves and as a result, there's a seam. I decided to try to fill this seam and smooth it out using a Bondo spot putty. And we'll just call this a learning experience. Oh, well that experiment there with that uh, Bondo putty, ugh, it's a mess. And yeah, we're taking it off. We're just gonna use some silicone to fill in those gaps. This is bad to worse. So I think that the putty actually has like disintegrated some of the foam. The amount of materials I'm putting in this table, I think I've got no choice but to rip up uh, at least most of the layers of foam, recut them, redo them. I don't know if it's gonna be salvageable and look decent. I think it's just gonna be quicker to recut. <sighs> There we go. Fortunately, this foam cuts really fast, so I was able to remake the foam knockout in a few hours. After gluing the new foam knockout in place, it was time to seal the partially assembled form. 
Now I've gone through this process of sealing a melamine form probably a dozen times in my past videos, so check out some of those if you want more details. For now, let's have a little fun with this and see how quickly I can get through it. I apply a layer of paste to the melamine, lay down a generous layer of 100% silicone caulk, run a metal fondant ball tool over all the caulk lines. Metal fondant ball tool pushes excess caulk to the sides, leaves a clean line over the seam, and the layer of paste makes it easy to peel the excess caulk away once it cures, leaving a perfect caulk line. And that's it for this episode of Caulk Talk. I applied polycrylic to the foam knockout. My thought was that the polycrylic would make the foam easier to remove from the concrete later on. Once the caulk on the foam knockout had cured, it was time to assemble the rest of the form. And I'm just using drywall screws to do this. You may be wondering why it is that I didn't just assemble and caulk the entire box for the form at once. After all, it's just a box. It would have made accessing the foam knockout really difficult and made it much tougher to caulk it and seal it. This time I'll try something that's never been performed in the world of concrete, a Jackman style caulk removal. One, two, three. <laughs> Now it's time for a concrete project tradition here, dexterfication of the shop with plastic over everything. As always, I'm using fish tone glass fiber reinforced concrete mix. It's a white mix naturally, but this time I'm going to add some white concrete pigment to make it ultra white. One thing when you're mixing GFRC that's pretty important is to put the water in first and you add about 80% of the water first, then add the concrete mix, then mix it, and then add the rest of the water slowly till you get to the right sort of soupy pancake batter consistency. Too much water will weaken the concrete, so if the recommended amount of water isn't enough, I add a plasticizer instead of more water to get to that pancake batter consistency. Okay, so that's a really good consistency. You see how it like falls off but leaves a little thin layer on there? Oh. That means it's gonna cling to the sides of the form, but be really thin, which is exactly what we want. And that's perfect. Oh. I then loaded up my hopper spray gun to spray the thin beauty coat. I started by spraying with the form oriented vertically so that it was easier to coat the tiered foam knockout. We then placed the form horizontally on the ground so I could more easily spray the rest of the form. Some of the professional concrete folks on Instagram advised me to spray in a U pattern pointing towards the portion of the form that is already covered in concrete to avoid sand particles getting on the unsprayed surface. I'm going to leave a link to those Instagram accounts in the description. You should definitely check them out for more concrete inspiration and knowledge. After spraying, we brushed the face coat with a chip brush just to be sure there were no trapped air bubbles. By the way, that other guy you've been seeing is the one and only Sean Boyd. This project overlapped with another one that he and I were collaborating on and he wanted to try mixing up some concrete. You should definitely check out Sean's YouTube channel. He makes some pretty amazing modern furniture. Here, Sean had a go at mixing up the GFRC back coat and adding glass fibers to it. We used the same mix as the face coat, but with less water and no plasticizer, so it would be a thicker, Play-Doh-like consistency. This allowed us to hand pack the concrete into the form and up the vertical walls without any back form to support it. Once the first layer was hand packed against the face coat, we added a mesh made out of the same alkali resistant glass fibers. This AR mesh adds strength and also helps to keep slumping on the vertical surfaces to a minimum. Hand packing this table was a grueling task that took a few hours. In total, we did four thin back coats, building up slowly until the concrete was three quarters inch thick on the verticals. Sean commented that this felt a little like being a sculptor with clay. And we'd soon find out that there was more to the sculptor analogy than we realized. I usually try to scrape the excess concrete off the top edges at six to nine hours after pouring when it's semi-hard, but timing just didn't allow for it this time. 
I started trying to wet grind with an angle grinder, but quickly realized the dust storm would blind us well before we could finish. So we took a couple chisels and started chiseling for over an hour. As we labored, we felt a bit like Michelangelo's assistants doing part of the grunt work so he could come back and shape certain important parts of the David later. Once most of the edge was chiseled off, I could then use an angle grinder to grind the edges perfectly level with the form for a clean, crisp bottom edge to the table. And then we evacuated the shop while the air filter did its work on the dust cloud. Before we remove it from the melamine, it's time to address how we're going to attach the hollow table to the base since I plan on having it inset from the table edges. The solution we came up with was to make cross support pieces from one inch steel tube. So I cut these to length using my angle grinder. Because we don't have a flat surface to work here, we've had to get a little bit creative. And since I had Sean and he's a fine woodworker, what, what do we do here, Shad? This is, this is some of some of our best work, I think. A uh, bunch of bunch of two by fours and some fuse it. Liquid nails, fuse it. Basically, we're going to make some bridges that then we can then set a wood base on top of that will support this whole thing. It ain't pretty in here, but hopefully the outside will make up for it. We used a drill press to create quarter inch holes on the bottom sides of the tubes and to drill larger holes on top of the tube. The larger hole on top allows the entire quarter inch bolt, including a half inch head, to be inserted into the tube so it can be bolted to the lumber via the smaller quarter inch holes on the other side of the tube. Having someone else around in the shop, which we had some fun doing screw removal races while demolding the floor. For the record, I would have won if I didn't have more screws on my side. I swear. After removing the melamine, we used some chisels to remove the foam knockout. And then we could get our first sneak peek at this topographical reservoir we've created for the upcoming epoxy pour. However, before epoxy, we've got a little more work to do. Some of the foam stuck to the concrete a bit more than expected. I think I should have put another layer or two of polycrylic on it and probably used some form release spray. However, in the end, it really wasn't a big deal since I figured out that a scotch pad and a chisel could be used to remove the excess form. It probably took about 30 minutes. So I've got a little area right here where something happened in the surface and we've got a little rough patch, but not a big deal. We can just do a quick patch up with it with a slurry coat, which is just the same GFRC mix that we use for the face coat. I let the slurry cure overnight and then came back and wet sanded with 400 grit sanding pads, then rinsed the table thoroughly. I then applied an acrylic sealer to the concrete. And while I'll be sanding and sealing again after the epoxy, pre-sealing now will help prevent any overflow epoxy from bonding the concrete and allow me to chisel off that epoxy more easily. I then use silicone and a scrap piece of melamine to seal off the reservoir for the epoxy pour. I laid down some painter's tape to protect the concrete from the epoxy. I subsequently found out this was totally unnecessary because the cured epoxy popped right off of the concrete sealer and wax that I'd applied. For this project, I was excited to try Total Boat's new thick set epoxy. I spoke to my friends over at Total Boat and they'd done test pours up to two inches thick, but I wanted to try to push it a bit further here. I started by mixing up the entire one and one third gallon kit of thick set. This was by far the largest amount of epoxy I've ever mixed at one time. And as I was mixing, I realized the bucket I had was just big enough for 1.3 gallons, but that meant I wouldn't actually be able to mix it without knocking some out. So I quickly grabbed a bigger bucket, said a quick prayer, and then dumped all those unmixed components into it. It worked. <laughs> 
I added blue transparent pigment to the epoxy, mixed thoroughly, and then poured most of the epoxy back to a smaller bucket that fit into my vacuum pot. Using the vacuum pot will pull the majority of the bubbles out of the epoxy and reduce the chances of having bubbles trapped in it. I'm told this isn't necessary with Thickset, but I wanted to do everything that I could to get a clear epoxy for this project. And now it's time for that big payoff, the epoxy pour. After letting the epoxy sit a few minutes, I came back with a torch to pop the few bubbles that weren't removed by the vacuum pot. While that epoxy is curing, I'm gonna take a quick moment to answer a question that I know I'm gonna get a bunch, and that is how much epoxy is in this table? I went ahead and modeled this up in Fusion, and I can pull that body out here, and Fusion will actually tell me how much is in there. There are is a little over four cubic feet and about 28.8 pounds. And that comes out to a little over three gallons or 11.5 liters. So it's a lot of epoxy. When I came back 12 hours later, the deep parts that were about two and a half inches thick had hardened completely, whereas the shallow parts were still really soft and gooey because they were curing slower. I scuffed up the hardened parts so that the next layer of epoxy would have something to stick to. I ultimately did two more pours to fill it up, letting the epoxy cure for 12 hours between pours. The last layer was poured all the way up to the top of the table. The thick set epoxy is really thin compared to other epoxies I've used in the past. Being thinner means less surface tension, which made it much easier to pour the epoxy close to level with the concrete top. As I mentioned, the tape turned out to be unnecessary. Some of the epoxy still got on the concrete and I was pleasantly surprised that because I pre-sealed and waxed the concrete, the cured epoxy popped off really easily with a chisel with no noticeable effect to the concrete surface. When I removed the melamine, I got another surprise, but this one wasn't so pleasant. I'm not sure exactly what happened, but since the melamine only stuck to the deepest section that gets the hottest during curing, I think the epoxy actually melted the melamine and got into its MDF core. It wasn't chiseling off until I discovered that I could use the heat gun trick to soften the epoxy so the melamine could be removed. Since this video is already long, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the sanding and polishing process. In sum, I dry sanded to 240 grit, wet sanded the concrete and epoxy to 400 grit with a random orbit sander, wet sanded the epoxy to 2000 grit by hand, and then used plastic polish on the epoxy. I have a pinned story over on Instagram if you're interested in more details on the polishing process. The base is just a fairly simple plywood box with a couple dividers that add strength and create storage nooks under the table. I made the base significantly smaller than the footprint of the table. I'm hoping this inset design will make the base almost disappear so that the concrete and epoxy top will appear to float above the floor. Assembly with wood glue and my new Metabo HPT cordless finish nailer went really quickly. I took the base outside and spray painted it white. And with that, we're finally done building this table. So we had some bumps along the way, but Overall, I am just ecstatic how this table came out. I hope you like it too, and if you do, make sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe and bell if you haven't already. And if you like this project, make sure to check out my other concrete project videos and epoxy videos, because I think you'll enjoy those. That's it for this time, and I'll see you next time.